Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunrise Drive here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands, South Africa. As you can see, we've got off to an incredibly lucky start, and that's why we started the feed a little bit earlier to show you these playful lions. They seem to have all just gone back to sleep now, so I'm glad we did. start up a few minutes ago so you can see some images of them playing about and this is the Inkahuma pride of lion it's a pride of lion that we saw last night and they haven't moved very far from where they were to be honest we are very very close to Gauri Dam where there's a live waterhole camera Is we had a report that there was two members of the coalition from the Sticks Pride or the Sticks Coalition. They're two males that we haven't seen yet, but we know they cross through the northwestern corner of our property sometime two nights ago. And then last night they must have come back in. And we actually heard them calling last night, and Brent did go up to follow up on them this morning. But sadly, their tracks have crossed in and out of our property. But the presence of those two males, and you could call them new males, they haven't spent much time here in the past, may have caused this pride to stay put and stay away from the north and western parts of our property where they do occasionally spend time. It will be interesting to see what happens going forward though because Brent and myself seem to think that some of the lioness within this pride will be coming into season soon. Even the young male who is a son of these lionesses beginning to show some interest in either his mother or his aunt that could be coming into season and this could very well be the end of his time with this pride if this new coalition comes through or even his father's come through and find him sexually inquiring with pride members that will be the end of his stay and he'll be chased off but for the time being it's a very peaceful and pleasant it looks like some lion might be heading down to the waterhole to drink so I think we might go and stay with those animals because the, the members here are quite relaxed <coughs> and just to let you know exactly what the temperature is it's 18 degrees celsius or 65 degrees fahrenheit Brent is following up on some leopard tracks apparently, so that's also good prospects. And good news for today, Brent is taking a few days leave, which is much deserved. And oh yeah, the guinea fowl. And Mark will be coming back, so that's really good news. Here are the guinea fowl that are alarm calling. And Alex.
Alex. Our tech wizard is also leaving. He's heading back to Moscow for a couple of weeks. After a long stint in the bush and some really hard work. members calling the rest of the pride. Good prospects for us because that line live experience that is happening this very second probably just many many miles away from where you are watching and it's also interactive you can ask questions and to do that you would hashtag safari live on twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv We did watch this pride at the same waterhole. This is the dam wall that these two members are on. The waterhole is just down to their left. There was some interesting behavioral interaction with these lion and a few big old buffalo bulls who were relaxing here yesterday afternoon when the lion arrived. And had a few very half-hearted attempts at trying to catch them. through from Susan and thanks so much for sending through this update Susan. Susan has informed us that there was lions calling at Arethusa Dam as well. Pride it could have been. Possibly the Salala Breakaway Pride. Possibly <coughs> members of the Matimba Coalition who are being chased by members of the Styx Coalition apparently. This is just reports we've had and nothing that we've actually seen. The tracks that Brent did find of the Styx Coalition were heading in the general direction of Arethusa Dam, but it's not necessarily them. Interestingly enough, the lioness that did try and call the rest of the pride and another one are all heading back there and now this one looks like it's going to be joining She is going to come pacing right past the vehicle. This is going to be awesome. spend many many hours every day sleeping up from 16 to 20 hours depending so we're 
actually prefer them when they're wide awake and playful than when they're fast asleep. And it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the pride are coming along. The young male looked really grumpy and miserable. And you could almost see a look on his face, wondering why the rest of the pride had got up so early. Just going to turn my game drive channel back on. it off we've got new radios and it's difficult to control all the sound coming through from the guides as we don't have earpieces for them yet updates on the call my pride it's just myself here uh, still lying up off twin dams just south of and now that the sun's poking up, we're going to have some wonderful golden lights for VM to film these animals and share with you all the beautiful sighting that we are having here. Uh, okay, great. Thanks. Um, can I stand with you? Yeah. Uh, so we'll take you. Uh, I don't know. Maybe them coming out. Uh, that's road. Yeah. So maybe they do. Maybe they kind of fit the wrong side. Hello. Hello. Very interesting to see. Oh. It will be very interesting to see what happens with this pride during the course of this morning because I keep looking back to direction and as I was saying it'll be interesting to see where they move to they haven't moved the whole, whole night which is fairly uncommon for lion even though they are full belly they finished their hippo kill not last night but the night before last and that was at Buffalo Dam everyone went searching for them yesterday morning but couldn't actually find them so they had moved away from the dam even though the I just need to listen quickly I thought I heard monkeys alarm calling could be dreaming Anyway, it is uncommon for a lion to not move any distance over the period of a whole night. And I've got a feeling they may decide to move for us in the sunlight, which will be great because we often miss where they move because they are predominantly active at night. which will be a great opportunity for us to follow them around and see what they get up to. And it looks like Texans arriving to join us in the sighting, which is great news. But Texan and Aubrey are around at the moment. Happy to
Good morning, Blair, on Twitter. Blair has highlighted a very good point here. I've been saying that we've got some information regarding the Sticks Mail Coalition as well as the Timber Mail Coalition. And she's wondering where that information's come from because she hasn't heard anything posted by surrounding camps where this interaction may have occurred. It's a very good question, Blair, and... I don't actually know. And it is a good point and something that we should all us with that because he passed on this information to me. Much as we like to try and know every finer detail about what goes on with these animals, the reality is that there's no way to do that because unless you followed them every single second of every single day, there are going to be pieces missing of their story and of the puzzle. So some things will just be left to our imagination. scratching and sharpening its claws. This is how they maintain their claws. It's their health spy equivalence, I guess, and that is a very large bush willow. It looks like a red bush willow that it's Nikki and Tara and Alex who are stuck in the final control. And we came to look for them and couldn't actually find them initially. Went home, had dinner, and at around 9.30 we heard some more roaring and rushed out to come and try and find them, and we did find them lying up very close to where they are now. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle quickly. This lioness is giving the male a bit of a te attitude, and that's understandable because... Again, she could be the one coming into season, and that's why he, he responded and got up and went up to her so quickly. I'm just going to move the vehicle. You can see him scent marking this bush, which again is a move that he is naturally designed to do, but not here, not in this area. He is in a situation where he actually needs to be forced out of this pride, and he will be forced out. The tough thing for this individual is that he is on his own. The lion stand a far greater chance if they're born with brothers that they can team up with when they do get kicked out of home. But he, in all likelihood, will be completely alone and have... A very rough, rough and rocky road ahead of him as he loses this pride and also loses the protection of his fathers who have protected him and kept other males at bay. It is interesting times though and no different to the life of any other young male lions. It's all part of what they go through. Interested, interested to see what the other lioness are doing. There, there are a few that have headed off further south of where we are, in the same direction where you can see the individual heading to now. 
and hopefully they'll rally the rest of the pride and get moving. Rosie on Twitter would like to know whether these, some of these lines did in fact mate with the Matimba males and yes Rosie they could well have and have certainly done so in the past. I'm not sure when you are referring to though Rosie so sadly it's difficult for me to answer your question and I cannot remember or think of any matings that were seen recently by us. Um, please do send any more information on this and as to when you think they were seen mating with the Matimbas. And for those of you who are new to the show, just to clear up, the Matimba Male Line Coalition did initially start with four individuals. They split up into two groups of two, of which two we see here. And those two, or one of those two, are the fathers of this young male. And of these other two youngsters that are about to come into shot now, they're possibly going to pounce onto this adult walking past. Here we go. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Playful, but critical practice for the youngsters to hone their stalking and hunting and pouncing. And who better to practice with than your family? Now, squirrels alarm calling are one of the main signals or signs that help us to find animals, and you can hear one calling now. So that's a squirrel's alarm call. An unhappy squirrel that's woken up to a pride of lion on its doorstep. Okay, well this is looking good, folks. And I want to loop ahead of these lines. I think they are getting on the move now. Completely different colored ears as well as tails, which are good follow me signals or signs for youngsters to follow. So that is the reason for it. They're no different to leopard having a white tail tip Oh, this is going to be beautiful. Uh, young males coming through the golden grass with some perfect golden sunlight. And let's see what happens when he reunites with the rest of the pride. Even though they've just been apart for a few minutes, they often have very elaborate greetings. tolerant of him. Morning everyone. How are you doing? Well, as you can see, it looks like they've found a cable of some sort. And cats will be curious. It's certainly not ideal, but there's sadly no way of intervening and stopping them doing what they're doing. And it's nothing to worry about, considering all the other things they chew on and come across out here. It's not that you have to be concerned, but like I say, just not ideal. Well, 
is this going to be the shady spot where they rest for the entire day? I hope not. Well, what I can tell you is that they will always have to swivel around slightly as the sun moves from east to west. So you may find them on the other side of this bush this afternoon. thing I will forecast for a little bit later on this morning is the arrival of buffalo to this dam as well as other antelope and other animals and the area that they're lying in here is perfect because it's fairly well wooded there's lots of hiding places for them to literally sleep but in an ambush position so that if anything does stumble upon them they're going to have lots of cover with which to use and stalk their prey. If it is buffalo that will be arriving, and I can almost guarantee you that there will be buffalo arriving, they spend every day during the heat of the day at Gauri Dam. There's seldom a day without any buffalo, and they can often walk along this pathway to get there. Now, even though this pride did try and catch some buffalo yesterday, it was a very half-hearted attempt, but now that they're a little bit more hungry, their demeanor may change and we may find them a little bit more willing to take on a risk and take on these buffalo. I just got an update from Angie in Ohio, and she said the Matumba males were mating with some of these Kohuma females in late February, and I don't remember that, so maybe I wasn't here. But what would also be interesting to know is how many of the females were actually mating. It may not have been all of them. Anyway, thanks very much for that update, Angie. And if they did, in fact, mate successfully at the end of February, it should mean that by the end of May or beginning of June, there should be some cubs on the way because it's about a three-month gestation period for the lion. So good morning and welcome. Pularay would like to know the degree of aggression male lions will show to their sons when it is time to chase them up, chase them off. And I think a lot will depend on the son's ability to read into the signals that it needs to leave. If it comes to a point where he doesn't actually want to leave, and doesn't get the father's, or doesn't read into their fa his father's signals, it would get to a point that they may kill him. Naturally, the young, young males will realize that this is not a good idea and head off before that happens. So I think the aggression will escalate slowly until they eventually do have potentially a scuffle. But it wouldn't make sense that male lions killed their sons when it, they came to maturity. So I think that happens very rarely. <laughs> I 
Lisa on Twitter would like to know if the females get involved in kicking them out. And actually, no, they won't. They will become intolerance of his sexual approaches. But they would be intolerance of any males coming up to them when they're not in season or when they are not ready. And I think that's similar behavior to what we saw. If we were to eliminate all other males from this area, this young male would stay with his pride and continue to mate with his pride. So they would accept him if we did create an unnatural scenario where he was the only male available to them, they would certainly mate with him. Thankfully though, most of the time Mother Nature takes care of that and young males will move far away from their prides before they are mating. But it is important to realize that in unnatural scenarios, this could become a problem because sons will continue to mate with their mothers and that will not be sustainable for the gene pool. If you listen carefully, you may hear a hyena vocalize. I just heard one whoop. And will they call again? They often do. And it's such a beautiful call, the whooping call of a hyena. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle ever so slightly because I haven't left them with an angle to do much with here. Bob on Twitter. Good morning. Bob's raised a very good point here, and she would like to know, what would this young male be called? Would he become part of the Matimba Coalition, or would he become a, a Nkuhuma young male? And he wouldn't become part of the Matimba Coalition. That is his father's coalition, and sons very seldom join their father's coalitions. They join coalitions or form coalitions of their own. What would in all likelihood happen with this male is that he may possibly take the name of his pride, the Nkuhuma pride, with him, but it all depends on where he ends up. So the property where he ends up and goes to when he does get kicked out of here will determine a name for him. and. There are varying things that are looked at when people do name lions or prides of lions or coalitions, and it varies from place to place. Most coalitions are simply named that I've experienced in the Sabi Sands, and there's a lot of big coalitions in the Sabi Sands, are often named after kind of law enforcement companies or, 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 or names that don't really have anything to do with their pride or where they originated from, but more of their presence and their demeanor. One thing that could happen with this male is that he could possibly join up with a young, another young male, and that would be his best option if he comes across other young males that are also flying below the, ter flying below the radar of dominant males, they could team up, help with hunting, and help with establishing a coalition and therefore a territory. Now this is a great opportunity to see the claw. Let's see if the one doesn't get its claws out again. There, here we go. We might see it. And again, apologies for the electrical cabling. They must have ripped it off of somewhere around the waterhole cam. I'm not too sure. Anyway, while these lion play around here, 
I'm sure Brent's dying to say good morning to you. And we're not going to be going anywhere. We're going to stay with these lines, see what they get up to. But let's catch up with Brent and see how his morning's been and see what updates he has for us. We'll see you later. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Brent. On camera with me is Brian and the Thumb. And uh, welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sands. You guys, you guys have been having a fantastic morning with Scott. Uh, I hear the Lions have been playing nicely. Uh, so what Brian and I did, we went all the way down to the north uh, western corner of the property. So we could hear the Inkahuma Pride roaring last night. And they were being answered by, it sounded like two males, that we thought might possibly be the Sticks males. Uh, so we went up there, we did find their tracks, uh, but unfortunately they crossed right through that little top corner of our traverse area and moved uh, into an area we couldn't go. Then we, we found two anti-perching guys cycling down the road on their bicycles and they said they'd just seen a leopard about an hour before. Um, so we went and had a look there, unfortunately we couldn't find anything there. So now I'm heading down towards Twin Dams and I'm going to go check the, the eastern sections of the property. Uh, also, just I've just had a chat to one of the other guides from the east of us and to let you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, apparently Karula and Tingana are on a kill uh, in a place called Shirley's and Quarantine has been seen. He has also got a kill in this property just behind me here. So. Hopefully that means they are going to start moving back towards us shortly. So what I'm going to do is go check down in the east and in the north, and maybe we get lucky and find some tracks. Let's get going. For those of you who might be new, um, we are live. So you're seeing exactly what we're seeing at the same time as us. And we're also interactive. So you can ask us questions about the African bush as we move through it. We're very, very privileged to be able to share our, our passion for African wildlife with all of you all over the world. He was in the east, um, to the east of us. I mean, they are getting to that age now where they might possibly spend less and less time in their natal territory. Um, and especially with the leopard dynamics changing at the moment, uh, with that Anderson male pushing in on Tingana and Tingana pushing in on Mvula, and then that new unidentified leopard that was seen in uh, in the north to the north of us. So there might all that sort of activity. There's been a lot of territorial calling, all that type of stuff might have uh, sort of speeded up the process of these these young males dispersing, which will be very sad because, I mean, we've been very spoiled with the amount we've been able to see them. But as I said, quarantine is not too far from our southern boundary. Um, so it's going to be interesting, an interesting couple of months to see what happens. Ooh, no tracks. hear me chatting um, I'm approaching one of the other vehicles so I'm just gonna have a, a quick morning meeting So we're 
we're about to hit our south, southeastern corner of the property. So my planning this, this morning is I've literally driven almost every road inside of Juma and we haven't had any luck uh, with any tracks. So I'm now checking the peripheries. Fingers crossed that something moves in um, and gives us a chance to track it. But that is what happens in the bush. You can't guarantee leopards every day. Wish we could, but uh, it is difficult. And we have been very spoiled over the last while. So I think it's time to play a little game. Uh, so you guys let me know what type of quiz you would like, the Sunrise Safari. Um, you can plant, animal, uh, insect, grass even, and I'll keep a lookout for anything in interesting. It is just such a beautiful morning and we are incredibly privileged. Uh, to be able to live and work in a place and, and share this place with all of you. So, those of you who would like a quiz, um, insect, animal, or plant, let me know, and you can do that by sending an email to questions at wildearth.tv, or you can just use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. for a second there. Uh, morning, Penny. Uh, Penny is asking, how many years can a warthog live for? Well, Penny, that is really dependent on the warthog. Um, most animals out here very seldom live uh, to die of old age. Normally, as they start getting older and losing condition, uh, they are picked off by a predator. But um, if I remember correctly, might be, I might be wrong, but I think a warthog lives probably for about between 10 and 15 years. But I, I'm a little, I might be wrong, but I, I think I'm right. About 10 or 15 years. Could you guys double check that for me, please? Um, and you can send your answers to questions at wildair.tv or just use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. tracks just yet so I think I might duck down off the boundary road and start moving in the area towards Buffalo's Hook Dam it is a has been a traditionally productive area for us for all sorts so it's Need to listen to the radio quickly. Well, thank you very much, Rita and Raisa. Uh, you've both answered on which you would like. Uh, Raisa would like birds, and Rita would like plants and trees, but please, no spiders. Ah, there we go. We're going to start with Rita's request. And this is a follow-up, so you guys should be getting to know this one by now. Hopefully, it was a new one a few days ago, but... There we go, it's to our left chat. It's got those yellow flowers. Very late blooming this year. Um, and who can tell me which tree this is? And you can send your answers to questions 
at wildearth.tv or you can just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So hopefully, hopefully after a couple of days, this is going to become another one of the easy ones for you guys. Uh, so good luck on that. So while you guys try to figure out which tree that is, uh, we're going to continue on. Let's see if we can find any tracks. Although at the moment, I might even take an Impala. Got some any tracks on the road here, heading east. So maybe we'll get lucky and bump into a nice breeding herd or a must bull. I think might go down and check towards Buffalo Dam. It's been really good for elephants in the last the last week, two weeks. Um, so at least we have a plan and we're gonna stick to it. to know at this time of the year do snakes grow into hibernation uh, or would they be out in the open to warm up well tom that's a, a good question uh, obviously during our winter months the snakes are not as active as they, they are uh, during the summer months and it also depends on the species uh, some of them will still be active and they will definitely bask in the sun uh, but probably not on a road uh, like here they can feel as minute vibrations that the vehicles cause and a lot of the time the snakes will try or get out of the way and be gone uh, well before um, the vehicle gets close enough to see them and so a good place for a snake to bask is around a big termite mound quite often and that is a home for a lot of snakes um, but then on the other hand certain other species are already in hibernation quite a lot of your your snakes that live underground your burrowing snakes but because we do we don't get truly truly cold uh, like you guys do in the northern hemisphere um, there are always some snakes that will be active throughout out throughout the year tracks on that section that haven't been driven yet this one's already been driven um, I think it was by Andrew this morning so I trust Andrew and he's definitely would have spotted tracks in this area so I'm gonna go a little bit quicker so we can get through to Buffalo's Hook ah, there's something interesting Yeah. This is a very distinct, different color and leaf patch in that tree. Mm -hmm. Well done, Michelle from Massachusetts and Catherine from Texas, that is correct. That tree we just stopped at now was a long-tailed cassia. And Donna, well done, guys. So what I just spotted there, um, I think I'm gonna have to drive a bit closer to show it to you properly. It is quite interesting. We do get a few different species of this particular thing. Is that too close? in on that sort of on the V where the, the sort of roots are coming out. Oops, 
So, this is quite an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure if you guys might know, but you can have a look. What Brian's looking at there, you can see the leaves um, of this plant that is growing right up in the fork of a marula. And if we pan out, you can have a look at the marula leaves. You can see the different coloration. Uh, sort of the leaves of that plant are almost a sort of dull olive green. Uh, the marula leaves are, are much, much lighter. Um, and it is a, a plant that's associated with Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think it is worth putting this one out there. Uh, sorry, Raisa, I will get to a bird question now. Actually, you know what? I'm going to tie this in. This is a bird question tied in to uh, this plant that's growing in the marula. Firstly, I'd like to know what is the plant? It's a parasitic plant that is growing in this marula. And uh, the clue is that it's very much associated with Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere. And in this particular area, the seeds of this plant are spread by one particular bird. Uh, and I'd like to know what bird is that? So there we go. A bird and plant question tied into one. So what is this parasitic plant that's growing in this marula tree? And what is the bird that spreads its seed? So I'm going to let you guys have a look at it for a few more seconds. Yeah, so that what we're looking at now is this parasitic plant. You can see a few marulas. Um, I'm going to try go a little bit forward, but I'm just going to try to show you the, the, the root structure of this parasitic plant, where it's growing into the marula tree. But just let me know if I get too past, far past the angle. Can you get it in underneath? Oh, my, too, too close. Can actually try maybe from the other side. So as we see that reposition, there we go. That's actually good. We can zoom tight, tight in there on that fork. Um, it is quite difficult to see. There we go. Um, you can see that the marula seems to have grown a much thicker in that particular spot um, where that that fork is, and that's because um, this parasitic plant causes the tree to release a growth hormone very similar to gall wasps and gall ants it's the same hormone and basically that means that tree goes, pumps a lot more nutrients into that area and grows quite a lot bigger and that is where uh, that parasitic plant manages to draw even more nutrients from the host tree it's unlikely that these plants would ever kill the host tree, but obviously they are. there's no benefit to these, these plants being in the host tree. Anyway, that's a nice one, tying in plants and birds. So in the meantime, we're going to hit the road and, and head towards Buffalo's Oak. Damn. Cindy and Shanae uh, for coming back to me on that warthog. So there's two different answers. Um, the average lifespan of warthog in the wild is one, one source says 15 years, the other says 18. So even though I might have been a bit rusty on my warthog, at least I was there, thereabouts. It said 10 to 15 years. Um, and I think that obviously also depends on uh, the area those warthogs are in. Uh, can greatly depend. That's why we can always give a sort of average idea of how long an animal is going to live, but you can never, never be 100% certain. And obviously all animals in captivity will always live a lot longer. They don't have any of the, the pressure that a, a wild animal has. So I'm looking for a bird party. Um, it'd be quite nice to find one. And especially in the early morning, a lot of the bird parties in this area, you can have multiple species, uh, seven, eight species in those bird parties. So hopefully we will find one. I am listening very carefully.
double checking all these road junctions. And no tracks. Uh, from Tennessee, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Uh, Leanne, I would like to know, do war dogs have nurseries where the young will stay uh, while the adults are foraging? Uh, no, Leanne, um, war dogs are precocial species. There's a word we taught everyone the other day. So precocial species means the babies are born as miniature versions of the adult and are able to run within minutes of birth. So baby warthogs will go out foraging with the adults. Um, they're obviously, they are quite vulnerable. And there is quite a high mortality rate on baby warthogs. But warthogs do use uh, burrows that have been made by uh, art farks originally uh, to rest in at night. And that's their sort of safety zone. So as the sun starts setting, warthog will go into their burrow. And that's where they'll spend the night. And in the early morning, uh, when it warms up a little bit at the moment, the warthogs will come out to spend the day foraging. It is quite a, a successful thing using those burrows, but depending on the soil types, uh, I've seen lions dig warthog out of the burrow, and I've even seen a leopard dig warthog out of a burrow. Uh, and then I've also seen leopard use those burrows to sit above them if they know, if they can hear activity, the leopard quite often will sit above the burrow and then wait for the warthog to come out. So that's why warthog always comes out head first with those tusks, just in case uh, there might be something waiting outside and they normally come out with quite a burst of speed they'll sort of pop their head out have a look and then shoot off Jody, dance anyway, Jody and Anne. We got that parasitic plant correct. It was mistletoe. Now I'm still waiting to see if anyone knew which bird is the one that spreads the seed of mistletoe. One person's close. Uh, Sam said a green tinkerbird. It is not a green tinkerbird, so I'm going to let you guys chew on that one for a, a, a little bit longer. But Sam is the most close with a green tinkerbird. So I'll see if anyone can come up with the correct one. different bird answers coming in but D oopsie sorry Sam was the most correct it was in the right general family so we're nearly at Buffalo's Hook Dam guys and I'm hoping there's going to be something there uh, maybe some Ellie's we're about two minutes from the dam three minutes at the most so fingers crossed I'm waiting for that answer on the bird that propagates the seed 
bit of mistletoe in this area. Uh, it is almost entirely spread by one species of bird. And the general family is a tinkerbird. Tinkerbirds are part of the barbet family as well. Give you another little clue. Crested barbers. No, unfortunately not. You're getting closer though. We're now in the right general vicinity. Tinkerbirds and barbers. to make bird lime um, well that and fig trees uh, and bird lime is basically what traditional hunters would have used to catch birds so it becomes very very sticky uh, and then they would put sort of grain or leftover mini mill pup around there uh, and when the birds came to try feed on this their feet would get stuck in the in the bird lime and would make a nice dinner for that traditional hunter. And what do we have at Buffalo's Oak Dam? The surfing heron and a hippo. Surfing, surfing heron and a hippo. All quiet on the Bovel's Hook front this morning. So I heard uh, Scotty had some really awesome visuals of a grey heron fishing. So I wonder if it is the same guy. There are quite a few on the property. Very difficult to tell. So guys, it's time, I think it's time, unless uh, I've got any more last minute answers on which bird is the one that in this area moves the seeds of mistletoe between trees. So I'm just gonna give you guys one last minute and then I'll show you which one it is. Suzanne, well done. Yellow fronted tinkerbird is the one who is 80% of all the mistletoe moved around um, is done by the very pretty little bird. Um, it's got a quite a pretty little voice as well. It's sort of a continuous pop, 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 pop. And there we go. That's the yellow-fronted tinkerbird. Very small, only 10 centimeters in size. So what happens is the seeds of the mistletoe get, are very sticky and they get stuck on the feet of the tinkerbird. Uh, and as the tinkerbird flies around and moves from tree to tree, those seeds eventually disperse like that. So, well done, Suzanne. Here we go. So I can get around. So I'm just having a quick look around. Um, 
while we continue to scour Juma for any sign of leopard tracks, uh, we're going to cross back to Scotty, who I'm sure has been having a fantastic time with those lines, uh, and see what Scotty has got up to while we've been fiddling around with Mistletoe and Tinkerbirds. Sarah from Fort Children, have there been any sightings this morning? Welcome back everyone, and the line have just started moving for, through a very thick block south away from Gowrie Dam, so we're not leaving them, we're just going to try and loop ahead in an area that's not too thick, and I'm thinking this is where we'll go in and start having a look-see, and I'm fairly confident we'll find them again. So don't go anywhere. There's eight line that we're busy following. And rather than following them through very, very thick bush, I thought I'd rather try and loop ahead that way, not chase away any potential prey, and also have as small an impact on the environment and the trees as possible. Now, the behavior's been very interesting, right? this morning have probably moved a quarter of a mile since you left us about 45 minutes ago and glad to hear you've been having a fun time with Brent identifying different trees and vines you haven't missed anything here the lions have been fast asleep in some quite thick bush until literally right now where they got up and started moving again up here it's not ideal there's still a lot of thick vegetation but we've had some great views of them already and I don't want to be crashing around too much unnecessarily they are moving generally towards us and as they get a little bit closer what I'll try and do is position the vehicle in front of them so they walk past us but it's important to just stop now and assess exactly which direction they're heading and they do veer off course ever so slightly from time to time and they could well change direction and come straight towards us if we're lucky say through the bush but it's important for them to move slowly they'll be cautious of the two sticks coalition members that are now moving through the area they would have heard them that's for certain and they'll also be taking it taking it slowly to not chase away any potential prey that could lie awaits or could be lying ahead of them in this thick bush so lions and leopards will move through the bush stopping and listening every couple of minutes and this thick bush that they're moving through is perfect perfect terrain for them hunting and ambushing anything that could be moving through here considerably warmer now that the sun's come out and you will notice I'm busy taking off my jacket. The winter days are typically crisp and cool in the morning but then they get hot and clear and dry during the day 
but then you often find yourself stripping off layer upon layer as it does warm up. Oh, I'm probably gonna. What's our best option to follow them here? Yeah. Let's see where this little pathway takes us. It seems fairly open and clear. back up. The slower growing hardwoods we don't drive over and that's important to know because we're not creating nearly as much damage to the environment as you may think we are when we're off-roading. There's something important to bear in mind is that people have been practicing the same behavior in the Sabi Sands for over 50 years now and as you can see, the bush is still pristine and beautiful, so as long as off-roading is managed correctly, it has a very, very small impact on the environment. question that's just come through from Riley on Twitter and she's interested to know if this young male could potentially jo join the Birmingham coalition which is five young males there is a small chance of that happening but I would say that they are already too established amongst themselves to accept a newcomer there's already enough of them and I think if those five boys came across him he would be in trouble Again, only time will tell, and certain things in nature, only the animals can answer. It is a great question though, Riley, and that question stemmed from the fact that I said it is possible for males from different prides or families that are kicked out alone to join up with one another and form a new coalition, so that's certainly not unheard of. out onto a road fairly soon and I want to actually try and get ahead of the lion so that when they do pop out onto the road we can reverse down as they pace towards us so that's the plan at this stage thankfully this vehicle that is very very maneuverable and makes for off-roading especially relative to Longer, bigger game viewing vehicles. Bear with me for a second as I loop us ahead onto a road. There we go. Very close. And it's going to be worthwhile. You'll see. I mean when we do get into position because I think we're going to be able to get this whole pride marching down this road we've just turned on to towards us and we are just in the nick of time we're just going past the lioness who's in front and I'm going to go straight past her and turn around and I'm guessing they're going to pace straight towards us sent her a question through on Twitter. If you'd like to send through a question on t Twitter, it's quite easy. You just hashtag Safari Live. Ramey would like to know what I think the odds are of this 
young males surviving once he gets kicked out? Whew, that's a tricky question, Rame. I would say 50-50. I mean, there's just so many variables involved that even though there may be statistics and percentages that have been worked out over the years, it will vary greatly from one individual's chances of success to another. But he certainly has survived the most difficult part of his life. And that would have been the first few months interested to know whether I can see if any of the lioness are pregnant and to be honest I can't notice that any of them are pregnant they could well be it can be very tricky to tell whether lions and leopards are pregnant even if you know that they've mated they give birth to such small young and don't show nearly as much as the herbivores do That being said, according to the report that they were mating in February, or some of them were, if that mating was successful, there should be some cubs on the way. Now they're moving very slowly, intently, stopping and listening. And like I said earlier, this is common. What they can smell and what they can hear, I don't know. But one lioness does seem to be looking very intently to the south, and that's her there. But it appears that this may be their next shady stopover point. see the young male and this is what's going to get him kicked out he is attempting to mate with one of the lioness then he did try and do it earlier on this morning too and he can't be blamed for that that's his instincts kicking in and taking over and it's up to mother nature to ensure that he heads off elsewhere that would be his father or other males that chase him off said it is getting very hot so the likelihood of them moving are becoming less and less as it does become hotter but then again these animals so often prove us wrong and yesterday afternoon was no difference it was still very hot when they arrived at the Juma waterhole surprisingly and it certainly was a big surprise when I got a call through on the radio that they had been spotted there. This is all eight of them lying here in the grass. And I wonder what 
their next meal is going to be. For those of you who don't know, their last successful kill was an abnormal kill for them to make. They managed to take down a hippo. It wasn't fully grown, but it kept them fed for over 48 hours. And although certain individuals' bellies still show the effects of two and a half days of eating, others are beginning to show that they're already quite hungry. And this hunger will certainly increase their likelihood of trying to bring down prey. Even when they're lying here, not actively hunting, any potential prey could stumble upon them. And it's quite often that you leave lions fast asleep in the morning in any given spot, come back in the afternoon, and they haven't moved, but they've got a kill because something has stumbled upon them. Los Angeles, good morning, and Maui's interested to know, how long can lions survive for without food and or water? And comfortably, three to four days, that's very comfortably they can go without a meal, from being full-bellied to their next meal. It's like I say, an easier three to four day affair, but they will feed as often as they can. On the opposite end of the spectrum, lions could survive for probably a week without food and water. And the individual lions in question will vary. You get some lions that occur in desert areas that will very seldom actually drink water and they'll acquire all their liquid from the prey that they eat. And it really is interesting to see how the same species of animals can adapt and evolve to survive well in certain areas that are very different to other areas where you get the same species. I think here it's fair to say the lion are spoiled. There's always water around, even in the driest of months in winter. And there certainly is also food. It's just a matter of hunting and catching the food that can sometimes be a little bit tricky. exactly what's been happening this morning we got extremely lucky and found these lion very close to where we left them last night at Gauri Dam and after an initial bit of morning play they have moved off a short distance from the dam we're probably half a mile from there to the south and I'm guessing that this could be where they spend the rest of their day they're still relatively full-bellied from that hippo that I've just spoken about that they fed on. And certainly great prospects for this afternoon. I'm guessing that they're going to put on a show for us this evening. Their increased hunger will hopefully drive them to try and catch something. And we very, very seldom get to share and experience them making kills and I think it's fair to say it's something that is a little bit overdue
also just to let you know the funny beeping noises you've been hearing on the radio is a new radio system and we're busy trying to fine tune the radios and the guys will be back out early next week to try and solve all of these strange beeping noises you can hear. I think these line are not going to do too much more this morning, and there are a few more vehicles that would like to come and have a look here. There is a three-vehicle protocol per sighting, and considering that we've been here the whole morning, I think it's only fair that we head off. We will certainly pop in a little bit later and also listen to the radio as the morning progresses, should they get up or should anything exciting happen, we will rush back here. But for now, I think it might be worth heading off yeah. and having a look at what else is happening here. It's a large property, and we do need to search around to try and find things. Well, hang on. What's happened here? What has this one lioness seen or heard? It's certainly looking intently in that direction. Hmm. So, we aren't going anywhere just yet, but in the next couple of minutes, I think I will have to make space for other vehicles that are waiting to join the sighting. Well, we'll certainly not go anywhere until we've established what has caught these lines' attention. There's just one of them that's looking intently into this thick bush. a false alarm because that lioness is now relaxed and lay back down. It really would be interesting to live just one day in a lion's body just to understand how acute their hearing is, their ability to see at night, their sense of smell, and also their speed and power would be an amazing Thing to experience, but we're going to have to rely on our imaginations for that. want to give it a few more minutes here just to make sure these guys are fast asleep and they're not going to get up in the next few minutes and continue moving in Pennsylvania, who's one of our Zoomies who controls the waterhole camera at the Juma waterhole. Morning, Tammy, and thanks for all your hard work on the waterhole cam. We really appreciate all you guys do for us. 
Tammy would like me to try and explain the difference between a male and a female lion's calls. And there are some very, very seasoned veterans of the wilderness that can tell the difference between male and female. I certainly can't. And Brent and I both got confused last night when we heard some members of this pride calling. We thought it was, in fact, the Styx male coalition that we've heard is snooping around this area. And that's why we rushed out after dinner to try and find them. And it was, in fact, these lines. So that's a perfect example of how tricky it is. Neither Brent nor myself knew. And very, very few trackers or guides that I know of can tell accurately every time whether it's a male or a female roaring. It's fair to say that these guys are fast asleep, and even though it's quite hot, it might be worth us heading towards the hyena den site, and I believe a few of you are interested in going there, so I think that'll be the general plan. It'll take us about five or ten minutes to get there, and again, we will be close to the line if anything does happen, but as you've seen, they look very lazy, and I don't think we're going to get too much action from them. chewing on earlier, they left alone and them and myself drove up and collected it so it's no longer in the bush and the lion are no longer chewing on that cable that they must have plucked off from somewhere, I'm not sure where, there are some cables around the Juma waterhole that are required to power the spotlights and the camera. I'm guessing it was from there. We didn't see anything. We just saw the end results. Anyway, that's out of the clear, and it must be remembered that the lion are very tough animals that chew on a variety of very sharp and bony subjects throughout their life, so a small piece of cable is going to cause no damage to them. So, just a couple more minutes and we'll be at the Hyena Den sites. It's very close to where we left the line, actually. And it will be great to see them again. Yesterday I went in the morning and the afternoon, and on both occasions it was not active. And that's not to say there's no hyena there. In all likelihood, the cubs will be hiding down in the burrows within an old termite mound the adults will not be present and the adults sometimes decide not to be present so that they can relax without being pestered and bothered by the young cubs. We should still be able to see whether we're in luck or not.
throwing termite bomb. I know you can't see it from somewhere up here. up here though and one of the best vantage points we have on the property is from this area where we are driving along now oh well i think i missed the little gap in the vegetation where you can't see the dense side from so we'll just head on down there and have a closer look some warthogs. Well, I'm guessing they are going to run off, so I'm just going to stop here. It's a long way off. But in thicker bush like this, warthogs typically don't hang around. They don't feel safe. They're so low to the ground. And even from here, even though it's a long way off and it's thick vegetation, you can immediately tell that this is a male. The reason being is that when he puts his head up, you'll notice a very two large, large protrusions just below its ears. The females lack those very large protrusions below their ears and only have another two, which the male also has further down the snout. So the male has got four two on each side of its cheeks and the females have only got two. Oh, they just turn around, it's also clearly evident that he's a male. And he's in attendance with a female and her youngsters. A lot of the herbivores will be starting to mate if they haven't already. And that way they'll all be giving birth during the first rains. So that's why this male will be here. Female warthog raise their piglets all alone. They often have the litter from the previous year in attendance, but the male's role is simply to mate and has no role in the upbringing of the piglets. We're going to creep on a little bit closer and see if we can get you a better view. Now the female, you notice her protrusions are considerably smaller and only one on each side just below the eye. The male's eye protrusion is far greater and it also has another one further down closer towards the tusks. She is a beautiful female that one though and has a very impressive set of tusks. Okay. was a pleasant surprise on the way to the hyena den sites. Anyway, we've been having so much luck with the other animals that you can't have it all. And you'll notice that the burrow, which usually has a few hyena lying around when it is active, has got nobody home. So... to come up with plan C now and I'm probably going to head off towards Twin Dams and Treehouse Dam and see what's going on there because it is getting hotter. It'll be interesting to see if there are any animals coming down to drink but it'll take us a while to get there so this is a good opportunity to head across to Brent's and Brian and see what they've been up to for the last while and we'll see you later.
welcome back, everyone. Um, it's been a quite quiet morning for us. We're now checking the, <laughs> the last section of the reserve uh, we can. But it's been beautiful. It's been amazing being out here. Uh, so before we get going, I uh, just want to remind everyone that if you are a new viewer, we are live, so you are seeing exactly what we're seeing in real time. Uh, also, we're interactive. You can get hold of us and ask us questions about uh, the African bush and what we're seeing, and you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or emailing questions at wildearth.tv. So uh, I've got a little quiz for you guys uh, as we get going. Uh, the first one is a bird quiz, and I'd like to know what bird has the longest migration out of all the birds in the world. Which bird has the longest migration out of all the birds in the world? And it definitely doesn't live at Juma. So there we go. That's your clue. I know it's a bit of a broad one. Hopefully someone comes up with the correct answer. I'm quite confident someone will. But uh, which bird has the longest migration? And you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. show you a bit of miles and miles of Africa. Oh, and what a spot. It looks like possibly a Marshall Eagle. Let me just move the vehicle and let Brian finish showing you. And that's all bushveld. Filled with leopards we can't find. And then you see that good tree there, Brian? There we go. Definitely looks like a juvenile Marshall Eagle. I'm going to get a little bit closer. Hopefully it doesn't fly. We should start seeing a bit more of the general game. Sam, Raisa, Michelle, and Mumu, and Colleen. Well done, you guys got it correct. The answer to that bird question, which is the bird that had the longest migration, is an Arctic tern. Sorry, there were lots of others as well. Those are the first guys in. Uh, an Arctic tern, and if my memory serves me correctly, uh, the annual migration is around 11,000 miles. All those in Pala are heading off into that. Into the thickets. We're going to keep heading on. Here we go. Put my Generally with very, very nice palatable grasses. Uh, and then as we extend, you get down towards the Gwari thickets on the left. And the Gwari thickets uh, are now as you go towards the edge of the beginning of a drainage line or, or, or seep line, oh, sorry, seep line, a drainage line, that water will actually sometimes during the summer months flow down if we've had a lot of rain. And these little patches of grassland can be very, very productive uh, for herbivores and then anything that's productive for herbivores is good for carnivores. So that's why we do like to check these areas quite a lot. Um, hopefully, we'll find something shortly. 